episode of the Bid Ram Show with me, Chris Goodrum. Uh, as per usual, a big thank you to everybody that watched last week's episode of the show, uh, liked, commented, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, your uh, your continued um, support is very much appreciated. And um, yeah, it seems like the uh, the episode went down uh, quite well, very sort of uh, uh, current, uh, I, I guess. Um, but for this week, um, I thought, Time to have another look at uh, some independent releases, some relatively new independent releases. And um, as you know, I always uh, enjoy uh, receiving samples from independent bottling companies. And um, I suppose I've said, I've mentioned it before, that the, the whiskey industry as a whole is is generally quite cyclical. Um, I mean, you take no age statement bottlings, for example. I mean, you know, a few years ago, it was all about age statements over the thing. Um, then suddenly it was like, no, no, age statements, they're a thing of the past. It's all about no age statement whiskies now. It's all about, you know, blending and sort of letting the, uh, the, 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 the distillery manager or master blender or whoever to have a, have a, have a tinker. Um, and then we seem to have kind of gone back round again. Well, no, uh, no age statement bottling is a bit of old hat. It's, it's back to age statements again, you know. And uh, the, the independent sector is, is cyclical as well, in a different manner. Um, generally speaking, you know, you, you have a, a new independent bottling co company sort of crops up, and they obviously want to make a splash. They want to get their their whiskies out there. They're quite happy to send out samples, all that kind of stuff. You know, uh, you do reviews uh, and momentum builds. And a few years down the line, they've established themselves. They're they're quite sort of you know um, they're, they're selling their their, their bottlings, and um, they feel they don't necessarily need to send out samples anymore. We can sell all our stuff. It's you know it's just the nature of things. Um, and uh, you know, then up comes another new independent bottling company, and so on, and the cycle kind of repeats itself. Um, and then there are you know independent bottling companies like uh, the, the 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 House of Macduff, who we're looking at today. Um, that. For just for one reason or another, just, you just lose touch of. Um, sometimes it's not even, it's not that sort of, you know, we don't need to send out samples anymore. Sometimes it just it just doesn't happen anymore. We don't, you know, they don't do, do that. And sometimes it's a new people come in, new reps, they bring their kind of like customer base with them and, and, and the whole thing kind of starts up again, I suppose. And certainly, um, that the pandemic and the uh, subsequent lockdown didn't didn't help. I mean, a lot of the independents basically just didn't have staff going into offices or distilleries and what have you to actually physically put the samples together. And I guess after the, the lockdown ended, they just decided, well, you know, maybe we don't need to sort of do that anymore. I mean, it's an expense, isn't it? You know, you're cracking open a bottle uh, to sort of fill in, to sort of, you know, you have to buy the sample bottles, post them, etc., etc. And, you know, sometimes they, they, I guess that um, those kind of when you're thinking about cutting costs to a certain extent, those kind of things, the PR, the advertising, all that kind of stuff tends to sort of be the, the first thing that's cut because it's the easiest thing to, to cut back on. But anyway, um, as I said last time, this is, you know, the, uh, earlier this year when I did a review of the, the first load of samples that I'd received from um, the House of Macduff for quite some time, it was it was nice to sort of, you know, revisit the past to a certain extent. So I thought, I thought it would be apt to do it again. Uh, so these are all relatively new releases, um, some of which are still available, some of which are not. Um, these were all sort of April, July sort of samples. So um, as they're all at car strength and probably all going to need a little bit of water, I think uh, I'll just introduce you. Like fire, lead to me to another space. Right, so, um, from these two sets of samples, I selected um, three grains, because uh, as you know, love my grain whiskey, and three malts. So we're going to kick off with the grains. The first one is um, the, a 15-year-old Invergordon, hold your horses, bottled at 63.5%. Nothing like starting with the lightest one, is there? Uh, so it's a, a, a Bourbon Hoggy, uh, code GC009, distilled in uh, August of 2007, bottled this year, and uh, like I said, 15 years old. Uh, second bottle I've been looking at is um, a Dumbarton, quite considerably older. This is a 32-year-old bottle of 47.1. Uh, it's a, a, again a bourbon barrel. You can just take a look at the, the difference in colour. I think it's quite remarkable. Um, and um, 
this is uh, CG007 distilled uh, in 1989 and bottled uh, this year. Uh, the third and final grain, again, this is quite an old one um, in relative terms. Um, it's another Invergordon. This is a 34 year old uh, distilled in 1988, bottled uh, this year. Again, a Bourbon Hoggy CG006. Then we're going to move on to the three malts. First one is uh, uh, Ben Nevis. Don't see very much in the way of independently bottled Ben Nevis these days. This is a, a young one. This is a nine-year-old Ben Nevis, 61.1%. Um, uh, again, a Bourbon Hogshead CM286, distilled in 2012, bottled this year. And uh, the next malt we'll look at is uh, an Ardmore. This is an 11-year-old Ardmore. Uh, distilled in 2010, bottled this year. Uh, again, a Bourbon Barrel uh, CM290 and, and bottled at 57.5%. And the final uh, bottling of the day is a Leche. Uh, this is a 12 year old Leche. Again, Bourbon Hogshead CM285, distilled in 2009, bottled this year at 56.6%. So no sherry. Um, so, should be interesting. And um, yeah, like I said, a number of these are all going to require a little drop of water, I imagine. So, uh, I'm going to keep this quite brief and kick off with the important. Right, okay. So, starting with the 15 year old Invergordon. Let's see what the nose gives us on this scent, shall we? Quite high tone, very alcoholic. I mean, I, you don't even really need to get your nose that far into the glass before you get hit by the wave of alcohol. Um, there's a touch of dried apricot, sultana. It's got that classic column still dried fruit character. Little toasty oak, little bit of vanilla. But really, the, the alcohol is, is, is masking it. And this is the, I guess, intrinsic issue with... Um, young grains I've oft, often found that, that sometimes they can be just like oak aged vodka um, and uh, I mean although this is 15 years old as we well know in the sort of the, the grain whiskey um, kind of area you know you really need to leave it till about at least 21 or so before it's got some kind of character anyway let's see what the power's like on this That's very alcoholic. It's got a good weight to it. Um, Invergordon tends to be, from memory, at the lighter end of the spectrum of grain whiskies. Um, some oily dried fruit, a little bit of vanilla, some spice. The alcohol is kind of enhancing that spice. Touch of dried fruit. It gets a little darker towards the finish, a sort of an almost kind of figgy kind of note, I suppose. Um, toasty oak on, on the aftertaste, but again, pretty mass that alcohol is just keeping it all pretty tight um, so we're going to put a little drop of water with it just to see uh, if that brings out anything else um, right that's brought out more of the oak um, it's toastier grippy it's also brought out some lovely lemon as well um, again it's pretty simple I mean that the retail price for this is 67 quid and I don't feel it's kind of got the complexity to warrant that kind of price tag personally. Um, I mean, it's, it's pleasant, it's not a bad spirit, but I, I honestly believe that this is too young for a, for a grain. Really could have done with a little bit more, well, a lot more time in my personal opinion, but sort of pals I know. Again, softer, a little bit more honeyed, fuller, still pretty simple. Um, dried fruit, a little bittering of the oak on the finish now. Um, touch of spice. Again, it's pleasant. It's not a bad whiskey, it's a, but I think it's just been bottled too young. Uh, like I said, you know, um, grain whiskey generally isn't ever going to be overtly com complex, so you need you know, that time in the cask, the oxidation notes, the cask notes, 
just to give it some more character and then at 30 or 40 years old it's still remarkably good value for money as it is it's priced I guess according with 15 year old whiskies per se but I think that's a, just a tad on the expensive side if it was about 40 quid 45 quid something like that I would probably say mm, okay yep yeah. Um, the price tag warrants what it, where it is at this moment in time. Um, but uh, like I said, you know, it's not a bad whiskey. I just think it would just have to retail for too high a figure. Right, okay, so big jump up to the Dumbarton. Let's see what the nose gives us on this thing, shall we? Oh, no, that's more like it. That is a stunning nose. Um, rummy, creamy, soft. Plenty of toasty oak, little bit of vanilla, little bit of um, coconut. Um, dark toffee, sultana, salt. Oh, now, 260 quid. 32-year-old whiskey? I mean, that's pretty good value for money. Um... I think and um, okay so maybe it doesn't quite have the complexity of a malt that's you know you can argue that I suppose but what it does have is a lovely maturity it's just got everything that the the younger Invergordon doesn't have it's got the oxidation character it's got more oak character it just smells beautifully mature um mm, sort of pass on Mm. Uh, so soft and smooth, it's rummy, it's dried fruits, um, oxidised fruit, subtle toasty oak, loads and loads of mature character, um, touch of spice, touch of dark honey, um, wonderfully long, I mean it really does linger amazingly well. Um, and when you look at the colour of it, you sort of like, you can see that that's obviously picked up a lot of character and a lot, well, certainly a lot of colour from the oak. So you, you kind of like suspect it's going to have picked up a lot of oak character as well. Um, and it certainly does. I mean, it is just lingering and lingering. OK, like I said, you know, grain whiskey generally isn't as complex as malt more often than not. But what it does is it delivers something really quite special. And I think the price tag, although pretty eye-watering, is certainly, for a 32-year-old spirit, pretty good. So, hmm. Swinging from next curse to the first, I fasten your heart to the tongue of wine. Right, okay, so let's move on to the 34-year-old Invergordon. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Not as dense, not as deep, not as rich as the Dumbarton, but then... Like I said, even though grain whiskey is a, a similar, you know, there are distinct differences between um, the different grain distilleries. And I've done a number of episodes on the show. And Dumbarton is certainly, as can be seen, at the weightier, fuller end of the grain spectrum, whereas Invergordon is at the lighter end of the spectrum. And this has got some lovely, lovely maturity. It's not as dense and dark, but it's lighter, it's nippy. There's that lovely nippy grain note coming through uh, with the sultana and dried apricot. Don't get a huge amount of oak, actually. I'm assuming aged in a uh, fairly refilled bourbon barrel, but nice and grippy, nippy, subtly spicy. It's got... It's developing an almost kind of barley note as well, which is uh, interesting, and it's considerably cheaper. Uh, the retail price for this is 168 quid, which I think is remarkably good value um, for a 34-year-old spirit. Hmm. Yeah. Let's see what that's like. Again, lighter, oxidised fruit. Again, sort of somewhere between a sort of a rummy kind of dried fruit and a cognac-y kind of dried fruit. No, um, a little bit of bitter oak, a little bit of toast. Um, 
the alcohol is kind of emphasizing the tannin I mean I don't think it really needs any water I think it's kind of pleasant but I'm just gonna put a little drop of water and just see if it just takes away that slight bitterness on the finish um, it certainly brought out a little bit more oak on the nose it's slightly creamier that sort of lemony kind of note is still noticeable not quite so nippy now maybe a little fuller so it passes on now yeah that sort of slightly bittering oak note has kind of disappeared it's got softer now um, slightly simpler I, I, I would say I think I prefer the intensity even though it's a bit of a trade-off really okay so neat it's got that sort of lovely intensity that nippiness that spiciness yet the finish is a bit short uh, you put some water with it you lose some of that nippy intensity you get the, a longer finish um, so it's a bit of a trade-off here uh, personally I think I would prefer that neat um, even though like I said the finish is a tad on the short side um, but you know that's 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 another good grunt So let's move on to the first of the uh, three malts. This is the nine-year-old Ben Nevis. Let's see what the nose gives us on this. Oh, well, that's a bit un-Ben Nevis-y. Um, okay, so it's young. It's youthful. It's got sort of like quite an alcohol prickle. Um, there's a little maltiness, but there's a lot of bubblegummy white fruit, which I can't say I've ever kind of come across in Ben Nevis. Um... It's a bit raw, there's some off the still notes, there's some cereal. The alcohol is quite well contained actually considering it's 61% and it's 43 quid or was 43 quid. Um, I don't think it, I I've, I've certainly haven't seen it on um, any, any UK based uh, retailers websites. Um, it's, it's a bit young, um, it's kind of almost got sort of like you know the classic Ben Nevisy character but then it hasn't so you know again this kind of fits into the sort of whole you know reasoning for why distilleries sell their casks because it doesn't quite fit into their flavour profile um, but then again it's a bit difficult to sort of see really because it's a bit too young it's still got that off the still kind of serially character it really hasn't quite developed yet um, but I'm guessing you know that maybe maybe it would thicken out maybe the maltiness the biscuitiness would kind of come through um it's certainly there but like i said it's um more about that sort of almost bubblegummy white fruit which i can't say i've ever come across on in a band nervous before anyway let's see what the parts are Whoa. that's alcoholic and it's raw it's intense lots of off the still notes I mean that's in my honest opinion so far away from being ready for bottling it's untrue I personally would have left that for quite a bit more time to be honest um, it's got some nice spiciness and an underlying maltiness um, again it's just a bit oh, I mean bloody hell um, Let's uh, put a little drop of water with it and see whether that just takes the edge off the um, uh, the rather intense alcohol. And there's not a lot of oak going on, I've noticed, in, in this. It's pretty much all about the spirit and maybe, again, that's possibly a bit of an issue. The fact that, you know, the oak wasn't very, um, or the cask wasn't very active, shall we say. So, um, but, it, you know, even so, at nine years of age, uh, I still think this is a, a tad on the young side. Um okay so the water has kind of just sort of dropped off some of that rawness now um it's actually more spay like it's grassy it's citric um slightly straw like again this is just very unbenevisy um like i said you know more more spaying character to be honest with you it's a, a little bit of sweetness now to the barley there's less of that raw off the still character um i'm getting a little bit of oak Hmm, let's see what parts are now. It's 
softer, a bit less raw, still a bit on the short side, um, still a bit masked. Um, the alcohol is certainly in control. Um, again, I think it just it needed more time. I mean, I would have either kind of re-racked this into a slightly more active cask, um, or you know, even a first, uh, a, a, a brand new virgin oak cask. That would have been quite interesting um, if you wanted to kind of give it a quick burst of uh, of, of oak. Um, I just think it's too young, too young, too raw. Um, not enough character. I mean, the price isn't sort of, you know, ridiculous. Um, it's not like, you know, but it would have to sort of retail for 70 odd quid. I mean, you know, you just go, no. But even so, I think 40 quid mm, is, a, a, you know, but that, that's the kind of nature of the, the, the game at the moment, you know. Um, I've had conversations with uh, with a couple of independents and uh, they're just saying that you know the, the the secondary market for the prices of, of, of casts is just stupid and there are people just buying them you know there are independents that are just going yep all right I'll have that you know uh, and they're not asking for samples or they're not asking for anything at all they're just basically buying it sight unseen because there's bugger all about uh, <laughs> you know um, and it's so this is the nature of the game you know um, and um, Anyway, coming back to that, I, I would have just left it a little while. Tell me that you don't love me. I want to hear it. I want to hear right, it. Okay, so let's move on to the 11 year old Ardmore. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Oh, that's a lovely nose. Um, fresh, citric, um, soft but sort of ashy peat. Um, it's got a real bracing citric character. Um, now, I mean, and the thing is, I mean, this is well, I'm relatively young in term, in in sort of age terms. Um, but Ardmore kind of gets away with it. I mean, I've tasted four-year-old Ard Ardmore for argument's sake, and you know, and that's been perfectly intense. And this is the thing; it's kind of got that intensity and that peatiness. It's not a huge peat monster. It's not one-dimensional. Um, it's a little bit of vanilla, a little bit of oak underneath, but oh, it's just it's just really intense, but not raw or fainty, um, and it's kind of everything that the Ben Nevis actually isn't. Um, yeah, that oak is starting to develop quite nicely now in the glass, and you know it's 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 just a really well balanced nose. It's fun. It's fifty seven quid, which is about about right for you know an eleven year old independent car strength bottling. Yes, I know a lot of people are going to go. It's only an eleven year old. Yes, I know, but this is the times we live in. Um, I love this nose. I think this is really really impressive. It's just just been bottled at the right time. I think. Um, yes, this could have aged for a lot longer, but you know now is is not a bad time. I think. Let's see what the password. Mm. A bit more oak now, a bit more creaminess, um, a bit more vanilla. Still got that lovely citric, lemony kind of character. Ashy peat, um, sweet barley. It's got a lovely sweetness just sitting beneath all of that citrus and ash. A um, little bit of dried fruit, a little bit of dried apricot um, in the finish. Um, Citrus returns on the aftertaste along with the barley. I mean, that is a lovely whiskey. Um, I mean, that's 57.5%, and it's perfectly drinkable um, on its, uh, you know, without any uh, any dilution. Although we are going to dilute it a little bit to see what happens to it. So, a um, little bit more grassy now, a little bit more citrus. Um, Less of the peat now. The peat has kind of really kind of dropped off. Um, I'm getting more barley, oak. I mean, the peat is sat in the background. It's kind of a, a bit more of a, a whisper of um, smoke and ash. Um, but that's lovely. Uh, again, I personally, I think I prefer that neat. I, like, I prefer the intensity. Um, but certainly sort of water has uh, uh, done that no harm whatsoever. Let's see what passes right now. Like 
softer. The peat really is only kind of coming back in on the finish. Um, a little bit more oak now, um, more barley, a little bit more sweetness to the uh, to the palate. Um, more maltier, chewier, fuller. Yeah, it, that's a lovely mouthful. I think that's one of those sort of whiskies that it's a case of, well, you know, you can have that with water or without water. Personally, I prefer the intensity without water. I'm guessing it's probably because my palate's more attuned to the taste and gas strength whiskies. Um, but either way, I think sort of without with water or without water, absolutely fine. Lovely bottling, lovely intensity. Um, and um, mm, yeah, like that. <laughs> Try and try. Okay, so let's move on to the final bottling of the day. This is a 2009 Lecce, so we're post um, cardboard. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, as you well know, and if you don't check out the last episode I did on Lecce when I did a comparison bottling and uh, came to the conclusion that sort of post 2007 2008 distillations were considerably a lot more cleaner than, than older ones. Um, so let's see whether this is uh, follows the uh, the course. Yeah, uh, it is a lot cleaner. It's kind of classic, uh, well, <laughs> classic. It's classic modern Lecce, clean Lecce, non-cardboardy Lecce, Lecce that I would quite like to drink. Um, it's got a, lo a lovely kind of smoked meat, smoked sausage uh, character, bog myrtle, earthy peat. Seaweed. Mmm, yeah. I, I mean, you know, if, if Lecce keeps this up, mmm, there's a serious danger of having to sort of like, you know, promote them out of the axis of evil, although it will, a lot of it will depend on, on obviously, Tobermory. And you do, I don't come across Tobermory very often. It doesn't seem to be sort of bottled in the Indies uh, very much at all, um, which is a bit weird, considering, you know, Lecce itself seems to be quite quite sort of a popular independent bottling um, yeah I like this um, and I'm I, at the end of the day like I said I have no preconceptions about any whiskey that I taste whatsoever yes all right there are some distilleries that as you well know are part of the axis of evil and I'm not a big fan of but and you know every time I get a sample of one of those I think is it is it gonna rock the boat is it gonna be sort of par for the course um, and um, you know, if it's if it's balanced, um, I'm quite happy with it. And like I said, this is modern, clean leche, um, and uh, I'm I'm I like this. I mean, it's it's not cheap. Again, I don't kind of quite figure this one out. You know, sometimes I look at the pricing of independent bottlings and distillery bottlings, and you kind of sort of wonder why why is leche so expensive? I mean, this is seventy four quid. I can just about kind of cope with that um, and um, yeah I know it's yeah it doesn't make a great deal of sense to me but you know anyway let's see what I rich earthy meaty green pepper sweet barley salt quite sort of drying tannic finish um, it's even a little bit and dare I say this estuary fruit on the mid power leche fruit dear god well what are we doing here um mm, this is so far removed from sort of like god awful cardboardy leche of the past it's untrue um, and you know I'm more than happy to stick this on the shelf um, if you know if I was buying this as a retailer and of course obviously any comments I, ha I do make in today's episode of the show or should I say have made are wholly my own and have no bearing or relevance on the company that employs me but you know um, uh, if I was um, retailing this I would certainly I would certainly stick this on the shelf I think this is a great lecture and, and, and it's because it's clean and it's modern and it's Mm. Let's put a little drop of water with it and uh, see what uh, develops from there. Okay, I I'm not quite so keen on it once it's diluted. There's a 
a little youthful soapiness there. Um, I mean, it's still clean. Don't get me wrong about that. Um, I there's a mm, yeah. I think. Uh, mm, anyway, let's see what the password. I wouldn't quite go as far as saying it's nondescript. It's a bit softer, it's a bit rounder, it's lost the, the sort of um, intensity again. Um, the oak is bittering a little bit on the finish now. Um, so I think the right call was to basically bottle this cask at cast strength. Uh, I mean, you know, without dilution, it really is quite, quite impressive um, and just gives you everything that you want from a leche. Um, Sticking a little drop, I mean, all right, okay, I knew, I mean, because I've already tasted these samples and I already knew that it, what was going to happen when I put a little drop of water with it. So you could say that I'm being a bit disingenuous towards it. Um, but on the other hand, I'm kind of giving you a more broader kind of picture of the whiskey. And, you know, sometimes I would basically, if I had my buying hat on, I would go... I don't want to stop that because it falls apart, or well, no, not this one, but yeah, it's not quite so um, interesting uh, once you put a little bit of water with it. But then, you know, you sort of stand back and you think, well, I just have to explain that to the customer. I just have to say, in my personal opinion, don't put any water with it. Um, but of course, obviously, you know, as, you know, as people, we're always uh, going to try these things out. And... Um, what am I trying to say? The customers don't actually listen to me? Um, no, no, honestly. It's, you know, it's all about experimentation. Some people will find that the uh, car strength, that's a little bit intense, a bit too sort of, um, a bit too alcoholic. And they may well prefer it with a, a little drop of water. Me personally, um, I would not bother with the water whatsoever. But aside from that... Um, it's a bit expensive, admittedly, but, you know, I don't think I would have an issue with selling it at that kind of, uh, uh, kind of price. So, overall, yeah, not too shabby, as they say. Come on, try and try. Come on, right, okay, so let's sum today's episode of the show. Firstly, a big thank you to um, uh, House McDuff for the samples for today's episode of the show. Hopefully... You know, you guys think it's it's been a a um, a balanced uh, appraisal, and um, you know, I, I I personally think it is. It's my, again, at the end of the day, it's just my my own personal opinion. And as I always say, I always encourage people, customers, to to try these whiskies out. You know, what may or may not appeal to me may or may not, in this case, may be appeal to uh, to to you guys. But anyway. Um, I, I, I will say I think the quality of uh, all of six of these bottlings has been very, very good. Um, and um, the 15-year-old Invergordon, just not quite ready yet. Um, I think it bottled a little bit too soon. Um, I'm not an independent bottling company. And the thing is, I suppose that... Um, I think they'd be a, if I did work for an independent bottling company, there'd probably be a lot more casks that I would reject than I would opt, choose to bottle, or just say that you know, uh, so the, the number of bottlings would be sort of quite um, quite low. And uh, but you know, there's always a, a, a commercial pressure, and you know, it's not the, the Invergordon, not bad. Um, I think it's a little bit expensive uh, for what it actually is, and personally, you know, it just didn't have enough complexity or character. Um, the Dumbarton I thought was absolutely stunning bloody expensive but again you kind of have to look at it in the overall picture i mean if you were to sort of you know um buy a 32 year old single malt for argument's sake uh you'd be looking at a lot more than 260 quid and i think that delivers an awful lot i love it um i think that you if you're more into your rums to a certain extent you would certainly sort of enjoy this and i think yeah great great bottling um the invergordon um, yeah, okay, uh, another good, a good, a good example of Invergordon, um, didn't take water particularly well, didn't think it really needed it, 
but it's a bit short without it. It had its plus points and its minus points, and it's a sort of whiskey um, that when I kind of taste with my kind of buying hat on, it it's a bit of a sort of a bit of a battle. It has to be said, you know. Um, you kind of like, you know, on the one hand, it has a lot, a lot going for it. On the other hand, there's some negatives, and you kind of really kind of battle with yourself, and to a certain extent, that the leche falls into that category as well. And so, you know, it does take some time to kind of figure out, um, as a retailer, whether you would actually sort of want to sort of stock said bottling. And sometimes it just, at the end of the day, it just comes down to the sort of, uh, you know, what you would have to retail it for and whether you feel comfortable. And although I like this particular bottling, I didn't like it enough to sort of want to sort of uh, stick it on the shelf. Um, the Ben Nevis, um, just too young. Uh, bottle far, far too young. Really needed some more time or shove it into some other kind of cask, a sherry butt or... Uh, a more active cask if you wanted to bottle it at uh, that kind of age you know I think 12 months in a sherry but possibly um, may well have sort of been been fine um, but I think as it is far too young uh, the Ardmore really enjoyed that worked so nicely with and without water not much else to say about that and um, the Lecce leave it Drink it at cast strength. Personally, don't bother with putting any water with it. At cast strength, it's absolutely, absolutely fine. Really lovely Lecce. Um, <laughs> so, I, I keep pinching myself, you know. It's like, how many times am I going to say lovely Lecce in the same kind of uh, sentence? I don't know. But anyway, uh, all I can say is that that's a good bottling. That's a good, a, a good peated, smoky, um, meaty um, smoked meat kind of uh, bottling and, and, and ticks all the right boxes as far as I'm concerned. So, anyway, there you have it. That's this week's episode of the show in the bag. I hope you've enjoyed it. I think it's a pr pretty balanced appraisal of uh, these uh, the set of releases. So, um, not much else to say apart from um, good afternoon and good ramming.